It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 290 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 18th of March 2018. I'm Ed Brown and with me is Dr. Shane Joseph. Hello. Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hi there. And on the show today we'll reflect on the passing of an extraordinary physicist. We'll talk about the twin experiments in space. And have a look at the Corellas, the parrot making a comeback. And we'll discuss our chances of being wiped out by an incoming Chinese space station. That'll be fun. But before that, of course, you can help us make this show by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledging to support us on Patreon. We appreciate all the help we can get to keep this show going. But let's begin with the sad passing of physicist Dr. Stephen Hawking who passed away this week uh, after complications from his ALS, or motor neuron disease. Lucas, it's a, a sad passing of someone who really changed physics dramatically. I think, um, I, I, the, for me, the takeaway for this, and, and this might sound a little shallow and a little sort of missing the point of the incredible you know, contribution Stephen Hawking made to to many fields, actually, not just his own fields, but but um, you know he became quite a uh, quite a watched personality, I think, by many people would wait to to hear what Stephen Hawking would say about such things as AI and and Martians or not Martians, yeah, aliens, aliens coming <laughs> and, and whether we should be you know broadcasting signals to them and so forth. So so he certainly was um, was very well regarded and 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 I think adored by um, media because that just his story was just so amazing. Um, and I've read I've read so many articles over the last few days uh, about him and and about that thing. But but again, I keep getting struck by how much it would suck to die at this current stage with Trump as president, because that's the last thing you know. You know, what I mean? like that just would suck. <laughs> you just think, oh man, I really just hoped you know that I, I, I. It's like not getting to the end of the book. It just it's so annoying. <laughs> and as I said, it sounds shallow, but that strikes me every time someone famous dies. You know, since since then, that um, that must just really suck. But yes, um, we're going to hear more, and and I think we're we're trying to organise a a show just to really focus in a little bit on on Hawking's uh, work and some of the amazing things that he did. Obviously, he came to prominence back in the seventies when he 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 really revolutionised the the uh, the field in terms of black holes. Um, he 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 was initially very well known for his. Um, um, discovery or that uh, black holes do actually emit something, uh, and that emitted thing, you know, became known as as Hawking radiation. So until this point, they were they were seen as basically just these enigmas that would just just absorb stuff and and would otherwise be completely undetectable and not, you know, we wouldn't know where they were and we we would they would just exist forever. Um, but there's there's certain fundamental laws of physics that that sort of breaks, so it's uh, it's a bit of a a problem. So so some of the some of the insights that he had, and when he he looked at this in a different way, his his um, uh, have led to to uh, us being able to, in some ways, knowing that we can actually detect them because there are things that are emitted from them, but also you know just uh, understandings into further furthering our our general knowledge of of of, uh, of physics it's just uh, amazing what he what he what he has done considering for such a long time he's been not only wheelchair you know bound um but but unable to verbally communicate at all and certainly the last few years of his life the the only movement he had was uh, he was able to sort of twitch a cheek and that was how he would drive that you know that that computer that, that generated the voice synth that we all you know so so very familiar with, um, and and obviously there's 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 lots of stories I'm I'm seeing at the moment about uh, people who knew him who met him. Obviously, um, Dr. Katie Mack, or Professor Dr. Katie Mack, we've now had we've had on the show numerous times. Yeah. She's been in the media recently, um, talking about her encounters with uh, with Stephen Hawking, and, mm. and a lot of people sort of commented on his humour. He kind of had a quite a um, 
you know, a cheeky, devilish sort of sense of humour and so forth. So, um, yeah, an incredible man. And, and certainly without him there, it's kind of like there's a void now in mm. terms of who, who else do we... Who else now is this stereotypical massive brain? <laughs> <laughs> the genius. Uh, yeah. And I did see someone tweet that, you know, the average IQ of the entire planet has just dropped significantly now. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. But it's interesting you say that he was kind of that media darling. I think he was a really, really good science communicator as well. For all his scientific achievements, he wrote books that motivated people to go into science, that really um, scaled down these complicated tasks, like uh, uh, ideas like black holes, and made them understandable to yes. the everyday public sort of thing. That- that's very true. I mean, a brief history of time was his his massive, massive hit. Hmm. Um, and uh, someone I saw a quote the other day saying that this is the 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 most popular book in the world that no one has read. Which <laughs> I found quite amusing and not really fair I, because I um I, I tried to read that years ago. I did not make it halfway through. I'm not. A, I'm not even going to lie. I remember thinking if I just read it really slowly and just think about every sentence, I'll understand. <laughs> <laughs> nah, and you just don't. But the problem is because he was dealing with, you know, quantum physics and it was just, it's <laughs> the barrier to entry of understanding that is so high anyway. And I, I consider myself a fairly intelligent person, but I could not get through it. I'm like, nah, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> yes. I'll just, yeah. So, I mean, um, he, he, he went back and, and addressed a brief history of time later on because obviously his, his, his aim was to make that accessible. And these, I mean, you can't trivialise how incredibly complex these these topics are, and 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 particularly particularly once we're talking about the you know that barrier that that line between between physics of the of the world that we understand and quantum physics, mm. you know that nothing makes sense anymore. That nothing nothing is within our experience, and we're talking about probabilities and so forth. So so when he's taking when he's trying to communicate that in an accessible way. Um, it's incredible what he was able to do, but he himself went back and revisited that twice with two other books to try and make it even more accessible because he felt that it, it wasn't enough. And in the end, he was he said something along the lines of, I can't quite recall um, the exact wording, but it was something along the lines of, um, I, I want this, this book to, to, to be simple enough that even if you just look at the pictures, you can kind of understand what, you know, the, the, the key messages here that I'm trying to convey. So, uh, so you're right, Ed. In terms of science communication, I mean that, that was that's an incredibly, incredibly dense, hard topic to try and convey to people. So, um, it's made me want to go back. It's a long time since I read Brief History of Time. I want to go back and read it again because, uh, you know, I've got very dim memories of it. But I do, I certainly do remember that it was very challenging in terms of, um, in terms of concepts that that went, as I say, are just not, not something you come across all that much. Um, and and I remember being very excited by it and thinking that I've been made privy to some incredible insights, you know. And, and by this point, the book was already you know twenty years old or something when I read it. So, um, so yeah, it's uh, it, it's as I say, I think there's just there's a void, there's a void there now that it's going to take a while, I guess, to see who who rises up to to fill that void and whether it's someone we already know. Well, mm. it could be, or it could be some young person who we've never heard of who. Just, you know, comes out of nowhere like Hawking kind of did and takes the world by storm. It'd be very interesting. But let's talk now about NASA's twin experiment. Uh, This was a mission involving two identical twins, Scott and Mark Kelly, to study the effects of living long term in space. So Mark stayed on the ground as a control subject. Scott stayed in the International Space Station and floated around for a bit. Shane, when Scott came back, their health was compared and dun dun dun, there were some differences. What kind of differences are we talking? Mm. Um, not the kind of differences that you've been seeing in headlines. <laughs> um, yeah, so it always seems to come back to this, doesn't it? This whole <laughs> misinterpretation of of science by the by the mass media. Um, so, so you're you were- saying he wasn't. He didn't have a 7% change of his DNA. He hadn't turned into a banana. Yeah, wow. pretty much. Um, <laughs> well, no, no Luke, <laughs> Lucas is being facetious, but he's half right. Um, so, for example, we share about, I think, 98 or 99, I can't remember the percentage, the exact figure, but we share a significant amount, number of genes with chimpanzees. 
So we'll, we'll say 99%, and I might be wrong, but it's about 99%. We'll say 99%. So if Scott's, Scott Kelly's DNA had changed 7%, he'd be a different species. Um, it did, he did, he did not alter 7%. Um, I think they, that there's a figure in this article, and I, that, and I think that's about right. Um, we are, even complete stra- strangers have less than 0.1% variation in their genomes. So you and I, uh, you know, me and Ed, for example, even though I'm totally different racial background, <laughs> Most of my genes, most of the genetic, the, the genetic sequence in my, in my genome is the same as his. Okay. So 7% is a ridiculous figure. What it's referring to is not genes, uh, the, the gene, the genetic blueprint, but gene expression, which is an entirely different story. Um, genetic expression obviously is the way your genes are expressed. And so therefore that can run the gamut from everything from, you know, um, you know, how much you fart to, to, you know, like what, what your immune function is like. Okay. Um, everything that's, so what, what they found was after, after he came back, um, they did studies on his gene expression levels and found things like his immune, um, responses or, you know, the genetic expression as far as his immune system function went, um, they changed. They, and they were, I think, I, I, they don't say if they were upregulated or downregulated and, and, and that's an important thing too because, if they become dormant in space or, you know, less functional in space, that might have some severe implications for space travel and space living. But that being said, it was still very, very different to his genome has changed 7%, which it has yes, not. Yes, he didn't turn into a completely different species. He did, <laughs> he did not, no. Um, what was interesting, apparently they found that his telomeres, I think, had lengthened or something like that. Now, telomere lengthening or t- telomere shortening has been observed as you age. Hmm. Yeah. And that, so, yeah. So the telomeres, they're, they're basically like the caps on the end of your chromosomes, and they, his apparently lengthened. So that was unexpected. Um, got younger. If you, yeah, I mean, <laughs> <Sort of. laughs> no, he didn't. Or just, Don't write headlines saying he got younger. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's, that's, I was being yeah, that, yeah. silly. <laughs> You're being very silly. Yeah, but um, yeah, but it's interesting because so he he went he underwent obviously living in space is something that human beings were not have, are not prepared for really. Um, you know, we have not evolved to do this, do so. So any changes in our bodies including our genetic expression, even including things like telomeres, including probably things that they haven't even detected yet because they, they don't know what to look for, um, will happen. And it's going to take a bit of research and, uh, and a lot of observation to figure out, well, okay, are these things that happen, are they going to be detrimental to the subject? And what do they mean? Like, what does it mean when his gene expression has um, has sort of been down-regulated or up-regulated in certain things? Like, is it bad for you? Um, doesn't seem to be. Like, he seems fairly healthy. As far as I'm aware, um, well, yes, yeah. so, there are yeah. obviously there are lots of changes that do happen. Um, I think there, he did experience some uh, problems with his vision. I think he got right, short sighted yeah. or long sighted or something. Yeah, um, yeah. and his his gut bacteria changed quite significantly uh, in That's space. Right. Even though I'm assuming Mark would have been eating the same food on Earth, not necessarily. Um, no, not necessarily, but I would assume if you were going to do a controlled experiment, you'd do something like that. Mm. Um, I mean, would you want to eat space rations if you were down on Earth? I certainly wouldn't <laughs> for two years. But, <laughs> but anyway. But, um, but the nature of the experiment is not what does he want to do. <laughs> I know that. I know that. Um, yeah, I mean, they also did say, what's also interesting I find this is that they that there was a big hoo-ha made about, not just that he was 7%, that, you know, this this erroneous seven percent figure but also that this you know he, he his, his dna does not match to that of his identical twin anymore now that but does sound alarmist but you know obviously you think identical twins have exactly the same genome that might be true when you're first born but as you get older and little mutations occur along the way you, you, you will not you will not both follow the exact same genetic mutation path you will develop little What's called single nucleotide polymor- polymorphisms, which is you know little base changes here and there across the genome. So, even though you start out as identical twins genetically, you will not die as identical twins. Um, okay. There'll be very very slight variation. So, and and that can be anywhere from you know chemical like it, it, any sort of um mutation that occurs through just normal living, yeah. you know. So yeah, and and the space flight may or may not have anything to do with that, and it's very hard to tell. So sure, well. 
Um, you know, it was it by no means a perfect experiment, but it was pretty damn good given that oh. what are the chances of having two astronauts who are identical no, no. twins? <laughs> I, I have absolutely no problem with the experiment. I, I mean, yeah. obviously, we have a problem with the way it was reported. And, and I think a fair bit of the blame, as far as I'm aware, might go to the, the press release that NASA released in the first place, which, as far as I'm aware, seemed to be very vague and did not explain the 7% figure properly, which is probably why people latched onto it. And how do you, you know, you can't really expect people, journalists to necessarily understand the difference between what is in your genetic blueprint and how your genes are expressed. Because it's, you know... It, Particularly it's these days when most journalists are not even science journalists. They're, you know, well, no. just being assigned the story and they have to write about it. Exactly. Based on so they're trying to sit and fight and they... Yeah, and they see, and, and they try to they try to write in a way they understand, and so they yeah. they end up misunderstanding it and misquoting it. So yeah. I think that's also an important point is that I don't think these papers have been published yet. These is these stories are written up based on I think two press releases. So did you guys see the uh, the retraction on Live Science? That was it was good that they actually looped around. Uh, Joe Benham who shared this earlier today actually uh, that uh, Live Science who had reported you know that uh, hey is no longer a twin. Um, they've actually uh, they've, they've done a, a follow up story on it, where, and the, the the headline was we were totally wrong about that Scott Kelly space gene story. Oh, good. And then they delved okay, into what really... they got wrong, what they said wrong, and how it was wrong, and and why that really would be much more troubling. If <laughs> seven percent. Yeah. Um, I didn't send, read. Uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't the actually link. read the original life science story, like because I, I well, so the the original erroneous. Article. I'd like to read it and see how that what they actually wrote and see how angry I get. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we can be forgiving since they've acknowledged the mistake and corrected it. So, no, but it surprises me that a science outlet would do that. Like, I, I would understand something like mainstream newspapers getting it wrong, mm. but actual science um, websites that surprises me still. I don't know why it surprises me. I'm <laughs> surprised. We can all make I, mistakes. I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah, I, I um I, I just I think that's really good of them to do that because so often I mean we this is a theme on this, this show so often about <laughs> um sloppy reporting or, or complete yep. mis you know misdirection and, and misrepresentation of of the truth. Um I think as you said, uh Shane, I think this their original uh story was a was a was basically the same rehash as everywhere else was saying, um which which probably was caused by the vagueness of the of the NASA um uh, you know, uh, the press release. release. Yeah, the release that they did. So, you know, it's pretty much exactly the same thing that they reported. But uh, so that was good. I mean, obviously, <laughs> with their readership, they probably had quite a few, <laughs> quite a few readers coming back and going, um, <laughs> you're not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Very good. All right. Well, Penny, the long billed Corella is a parrot that uh, is now becoming the bane of many farmers even though there was a time not too long ago when their future was precarious. They were almost endangered, weren't they? They were. And I wanted to talk about this story because there's a big flock of these birds that live in my area. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know what a corella looks like, imagine a sulphur-crested cockatoo, but it's not got the crest and it looks like it's a bit stoned, like its eyes are very <laughs> red. <laughs> but they have that real, like, yell and they love to travel in big flocks and I remember once um just a whole flock of them were in the backyard decimating the trees there or in our front we've got those you know those plane trees that have those horrible yeah. um pollen cones I don't even know what they are they were, so they were in that tree the other day just hundreds well it felt, seemed like hundreds of them at least dozens of them just putting that pollen crap all over the street <laughs> but I haven't noticed them around before. So, I mean, this is something I've started to notice in maybe the last five or six years. And so I was interested to read that um, corellas are really making a comeback. So in the wild, they would eat uh, yam daisies and other sort of um, native plants with fleshy roots. But, of course, there's not many wild areas left and certainly not very many wild grasslands left in Australia. So when it was settled by white people, sheep and so on got rid of those native ecosystems um, where the corellas used to live. There's towns, there's crops, there's pastures, but there's not really, um, you know, native plants and native lilies and so on. So the corellas 
adapted and they turned to eating crops, things like oats, corn, sunflower seeds and onion grass, which I'm sure most Melbourne school children know. They also liked to eat nuts. As you can imagine, that's not great for farmers. In the suburbs, they, they look down under the ground for kind of corms and grass stems. They dig up golf courses, bowling greens, tennis courts, um, people's gardens, trees, trying to get things to eat. And they're actually expanding. So they've moved into Melbourne. They didn't used to be in this area. There's flocks in Tasmania and in Queensland. So we're really talking around the whole eastern seaboard of Australia as they escape from aviaries and release. And if they can kind of fill in that gap, their range and their number will be quite enormous. So in a way, it's a good news story because here's a native bird that has had its you know, it's, its own, it's, na it's sort of natural habitat disrupted. It's not a kind of habitat that um, tends to be preserved in na national parks. Like most of our national parks preserve forests and woodlands or deserts rather than those kind of grasslands, which used to be so widespread. Um, so it's really only solution has to be to adapt. And yet it's a complete yeah. pest. So Ed found an article about Port Ferry Council um, was considering shooting all the corellas but <laughs> realised that they could just plant a different kind of grass that they didn't like so much. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I guess it's one of those stories where you think, oh, good, you know, a native bird is surviving, but it's also a real pain in the ass. And <laughs> <laughs> it's a noisy pain it's in the ass. It's a noisy too. pain in the ass. You know, I love them. We don't get much contact with wild animals in the suburbs yeah, and particularly natives particularly yeah, natives too. like i guess I, yeah. I guess those ravens are around with ah, ah, ah. <laughs> yeah. why do native birds have such annoying calls <laughs> well where, where i live we're like we've got a heap of rainbow lorikeets everywhere mm. um mm -hmm. a fair few galahs and yeah they're all noisy buggers and they are all, noisy and, and, and they're all and they're all fairly destructive too like <laughs> it's the sound of nature come on <laughs> all right well if you ever get that feeling of impending doom that sort of sense that somewhere out of out there there's a chinese space station hurtling uncontrollably towards earth with your name on it well, no, I don't either. That'd be weird. That's very specific sense of doom. <laughs> but as it happens, there is a Chinese space station hurtling out of control towards Earth, but it probably, maybe, won't hit anyone, right, Lucas? Maybe. Not probably, sort of. The thing is, we don't know. <laughs> um, it's a bit of a problem because really, at, you know, the, the, the key point with this, this space station that the Chinese um, launched back in 2013 and and um, they had plans to deorbit you know normally properly in in 2016 um, it's it's the uh, Tiangong one uh, which which means heavenly palace uh, spacecraft yeah. so uh, so yeah the, the intention was to to um, to do several of these as they learn their learnings the same that uh, the international collaborators on the ISS have learned their learnings uh, the intention was to deorbit it in 2016, but but that didn't happen. Um, they or 2015, I think it was. They were going to deorbit it, but um, I think I remember this. There was there was like a big storm of uh, space debris, and then Sandra Bullock had to go to the wrong one, and then she, there was the Russians. And... Yes, that's the one. Is that the no, one? Actually, I've, got, I've, I've murdered all the dates. Let, let me just start again with the date. So it, it, it's been there since 2011. And the intention was to deorbit it in 2013. So that's the 2013. That's when it was meant to be deorbited. But they, they made change, changes to plans for various reasons that I don't share with the rest of the world. And basically, come 2016, they lost control of it. Um, so since 2016, it's now been in a decaying, slowly decaying orbit. And uh, it's expected to, uh, to re-enter um, our atmosphere um, this year, in April. Not, not far from now at all. About roughly April 3. So um, the problem is that the Chinese haven't shared with the rest of the world um, its dimensions, what it's made of, its mass, um, what various parts of the spacecraft are made of, what fuel it carries. Um, we, we don't know anything. So it makes it really, really hard for us to figure out where it's going to come in. And, and so so it, it, could be, it could be the size of a Star Destroyer. 
and we wouldn't know. Well, we 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 have obviously <laughs> there's there's uh, um, estimates based on observations of how large it is, but the problem is more about the materials. We don't know yeah. how much of it's going to survive re-entry. Um, so so one quite feasible uh, possibility is that it contain it might have it like a titanium fuel tank. It might contain hydrazine in its fuel. In its fuel tank, which which will be quite problematic if that if that crashes near a um, populated area. So in terms of you know just looking at the surface of the Earth, so this thing basically is on an orbit between roughly like 40, 40 to forty three degrees north and forty three degrees south. So it, it you know it sort of has this 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 orbit at, that goes up and down like a sine wave across the equator up to forty three and down to forty three and, and back up again. So. Um, so it, it, it really it really covers a, a lot of a lot of countries. It cover, covers you know quite a lot of uh, Australia. It covers you know a big swathe of Africa, um, all the way to the you know up to the Middle East, South America, China, parts of Europe, um, <laughs> North and South America. So, so it does cover you know mm. the main spots. Awesome. <laughs> um, and and all the land masses I'm at, noticing. <laughs> yeah. So if you, yeah, I mean, obviously, if you're in Antarctica, you're cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> New Zealand pretty much is, is okay. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, pretty much every other continent is, is a possibility. But um, if you look at that same area, obviously, you know, 70-ish percent of the, the world, the, the Earth's surface is, is, is ocean. So, um, so there's a very good chance it will go down into ocean, uh, which is obviously the ideal outcome. Um, but, uh, but the, the fact is we just don't know. We, we have no idea where it's going to come down. We don't know where, where, when exactly, or how much of it will survive re-entry. So, um, <laughs> we, it could, it's kind of grab the popcorn folks because <laughs> this could be very interesting. <laughs> mm, yeah. It will make a, a decent, um, thing to watch, I guess, in the sky. It'll probably be quite bright as it burns up in the upper atmosphere, but I oh, yeah. don't know how much yeah, will yeah. burn up and how much won't. Yeah. If it's if it ends up in in uh, you know your swathe of sky, even if only part of its reentry is over you, you know your your visible sky, um, you it, it, depending on how far into that reentry it actually is, this thing will 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 give off quite a, a show. Um, we we will be expecting to see kind of a uh, imagine like the um, the launches of, of the Dragon rocket. You remember, remember the smoke sort of mm -hmm. as it as it went up, kind of that in reverse is is uh, is quite feasible. But as I say, it really just depends on how much of it actually um, how much of it survives um, because they've got no control whatsoever. They can't do any kind of planned burns to adjust its mm -hmm. its uh, the the um, how deep or shallow the the reentry is and so forth. Mm -hmm. So. I'm so, yeah, surprised could be interesting. if they if they if they haven't told us the rest of the world anything about the composition, the dimensions of it. I'm surprised that they've admitted they lost control of it. I, I know I know there was some hoo-ha that they weren't admitting for a while that they'd lost control of it back in whenever it was that this started happening. But the fact that they actually came out and said, "Yeah, sorry guys, our bad." Um, nah. I'm just I'm just I'm surprised they even went that far. <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you. Yeah, I mean it's it's weird sometimes the. The information that's shared is is surprising, and other times, you know, it's just kind of exactly what we'd expect. But you know, I guess there's some silver lining on it that um, when presented with this sort of thing, um, you know, you've you, you've got some choices to make, and and one of the choices that we're facing other space agents around the world was, hmm, can we get any science out of this? Mm. Yes, we can. <laughs> Uh, so I like that as well. So there, basically there's, there's um, 13 different space agencies around the world. Space Force are not involved yet because uh, they, <laughs> they're not sure. up and running. But the, the other, there's a whole lot of other space agencies around the world and they'll basically be observing this and they'll, they'll be using it as a, as a way to test tracking models um, and, and also equipment and, and, and you know, radars and, and optical telescopes and so forth to, to figure out or basically to dial in on, on our predictive abilities for this sort of thing because, you know, it's going to happen again. There's no doubt. Yeah, mm, that's pretty cool. I, I predict that Trump will come out and say that, that it's an attack on America. <laughs> Probably, you <will>. yeah. <laughs> Probably <laughs> those, those dastardly Chinese, you know, with their satellites crashing to Earth. How dare they? Fake. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm being facetious, but I wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if that. Uh, yeah, no, no, at this it's, point, it's... nothing surprises <laughs> me anymore. So nothing. Anything that that he says is just yeah. I don't even raise an eyebrow anymore. It's, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, well, speaking of things going wrong in space, though, uh, Lucas, it's not looking good for our beloved Kepler uh, space probe, which has been hunting exoplanets and found 
thousands now in the last few years, uh, it's uh, nearing the end of its life. It is, and we, we know that, you know, we've talked about Kepler a number of times on the show, and it, it is it is just an amazing mission, just because it is, it's one of those missions that has gone so far beyond its original design, you know, purpose, that, that it's just, it's just been fantastic. So, so Kepler's had uh, a primary mission and, a, and, a, and basically a, a, a secondary mission, which, which came about after it had some, is- some issues. Uh, so the primary mission was, was, um, was cut short when, when it, it, um, it lost the second of four reaction wheels that it has. Those reaction wheels are like, imagine a, a, a bike wheel spinning. Um, a, a bike wheel spinning is basically acts like a gyro and it can keep you aligned. Um, so that's just more or less that on a smaller scale that's in these things, uh, with weights on them. And those, those things will, you know, unless something interferes with them, they'll always want to keep spinning in the same direction. Um, so that's a good thing. You can use them to aim. Um, so this, this particular spacecraft is on an orbit that's, uh, that basically sweeps around the sun. It's on its own orbit, uh, around the sun. And, uh, as it goes around the sun, it was initially, pointed at a particular piece of sky and it was just measuring that really narrow piece of sky and um and and looking for uh for candidates of um uh, uh, basically planet candidates around distant stars but then when the second reaction wheel died they were they couldn't aim this thing anymore so they had to figure out well how can we how can we get some more science out of this thing because um you know it's got a lot more potentially to give and and ever Ever resourceful, uh, NASA came up with um, with a, a new way of aiming it, which is just mind blowingly cool. Basically, they've gone well. Okay, so we we can't we can't actually keep it aimed anymore with the reaction wheels, so it's going to have a wobble on it. Um, but we do, when we think about it, we do have some pressure coming from one direction constantly. We could actually use that to aim it because that's a constant directional input. Uh, it's a reference for us. So they actually now use the light pressure from the solar wind to to aim this thing, which is so freaking cool. I mean, that's sort of like using a sail on a boat yeah, and sort of. changing tack to change direction. Yes. So um, so what this means is now because because it's orbiting around the sun that where it points now sort of um, rotates in a bit of a a small sort of ellipse as it, it rotates around a patch of sky. So it basically just meant that instead of staring at the, the patch of the sky that it initially, was, uh, initially would stare at, it now stares at a, a few different um, areas throughout the year, as it, or each year as it goes around the sun. Um, but now, I mean, it, it's done a huge amount of science in its K2, its, second, its, its secondary mission. Um, and, uh, but now, unfortunately, it's running out of fuel. Um, they reckon the fuel tank will run dry within a few months. Um, they say reckon, like I say reckon, because yeah, they don't sure actually know. Have an idea. Because it turns out there's no, like, there's not a fuel gauge or anything on it. There's no way of actually knowing exactly how much fuel. There's no there. sensor to tell Nothing. how much petrol is in the tank. <laughs> nope. They just basically, it's already so far beyond its original design, you know, period that, yeah. hey, um, they. <laughs> They and they and unlike other things like if you look at other probes like um, you know Cassini recently for example where they had to do the death dive uh, which and, and Juno will have a, a similar fate um, the, the reason for that is there are icy moons around Saturn and, and Jupiter which present possible you know ha- life harbor um, so if we were to crash accidentally on one of those with with another probe that hadn't been adequately prepared we could we could have an imp- impact on life or we could seed life. You know, there's, there's all sorts of things that could happen. So in the case of um, Kepler, though, it's on its own orbit um, around the sun. It, it's, there's nothing. It's not going to hit anything. So they don't need to worry about that. So it will do science right up to its last gasp, basically. And once it runs out of fuel, the way it's affected is it's no longer able to aim its, its, its antenna back at Earth to send data. Mm-hmm. So it will still have power, because it has, you know, it's got power source in terms of solar um, uh, uh, sails and so forth. Not solar sails, sol- solar um, uh, photo sensor. Panels. Panels, that's the one. I couldn't think of the word. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so, so power is not, not the issue. It's just the fact that it can't aim back at Earth anymore to send data and, and to receive telemetry. Um, so so it basically will just go dark and it will just be on a never-ending loop around the sun. And it won't be the first. I think we've, we covered another... We covered another um, spacecraft 
uh, yeah. maybe a couple of years ago that there was a, a renewed interest in this craft because it was coming around uh, and it was it was chasing Earth on a on a very similar orbit to Earth. Mm. I can't remember the name of the spacecraft now, but they had to go back into some really old. Um, yeah. you know, equipment like thirty-year-old yeah, manuals like, or something. Yeah, exactly. And and they had to they had to sort of build equipment that was similar to these computers back back in the seventies or something when this probe was launched because they thought we might actually be able to wake this thing up and give it some commands. Um, I don't know what the commands I, would be. Maybe yeah. you know. phone home. Phone home. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the idea though that Kepler is still going to be doing the science and it just can't tell us what it finds Aww. and it just makes me think you know tell me there's this really big hard drive or something on it that's going to be storing all this data and one day we'll maybe get catch it and find yes it's found all the exoplanets that we also found using some other more advanced technique or something but yeah i don't think so and i think it's no. it's a case of without the telemetry and the commands coming back from earth to to give it its new its next batch of targets it will just stop it will just stop doing what it's what it needs to do and then over time it's uh it will it will also, because of no fuel, won't be able to orient, you know, its its solar panels towards yeah, the sun no, either. Yeah. So it'll just end oh, up in a course, bit of a yeah. tumble. Yeah. And just coming back to the fuel thing, so it's got no way of knowing how much fuel it has in the tank. Is that just an oversight, or is that a deliberate reason I, that they didn't need to know that? I, I think that it's a matter of they 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 would have fairly good estimates as to how much they'd get because they know exactly yeah. how much fuel they have burned. In this craft, yep. it's not like it can, it's going to evaporate. Um, it's, yep. it's still, you know, they, they started with a certain amount of fuel, and they know how much they've used. So the estimates are based on usage, and then, um, you know, it do, it do, I mean, it does. It, it did strike me as surprising that there's no sensor on it, but I guess it's always a matter of cutting down on weight, and every little thing you add oh, in God's there way. adds up. So and yeah, it just add an why add an extra complication to yeah. a system if you don't need it. Yeah. Yep. All right. Exactly. Well, I think that's our show. As usual, you can find all the links in the show notes or at scienceontop.com slash 290. Please leave us feedback there or on social media. And please, if you can, give us a review on Apple Podcasts. And don't forget, you can always help us out by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledging to support us on Patreon. Thanks for joining me today, Shane, Penny and Lucas. Thank you. No worries, Thanks, Ed. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Some recent work indicates that particles that fall into a black hole can come out again from another black hole somewhere else in the universe. At first sight, this seems the ideal method of space travel. Just find a black hole and jump in it. But there are snags. First, there doesn't seem to be any way to choose where you come out. Worse than that, your history in real time would come to a sticky end as you were torn apart by the gravitational fields inside a black hole. Your history in imaginary time would continue out of the other black hole. But that might not be much consolation to someone being made into spaghetti. It would be like traveling on some airlines I could name. <laughs> <laughs>